Okay, everyone. It's great to be here. I'll, just a quick introduction. Some of you may not know who we are. Uh, this is Stefan Kadelki. He is a assistant lab director over at CHOP, also a member of the Division of Pathology Informatics, uh, also at CHOP, and is the course director of the course that uh, we'll be describing to you, Reproducible Clinical Data Analysis with R&R &R Studio. He's also a, a certified instructor, actually, in R. And uh, for those who don't know me, I'm also a director over at CHOP and a director at the Pathology Informatics Division and a director with Stefan. So what we're going to be talking to you right now is how we all analyze data and how the analytical tools that we choose to use as we analyze our data impact the reproducibility and really the overall validity of the analysis. And when I use the term reproducibility in this context, what I mean is the ease with which another individual can take that raw data that you started with and recreate the same exact statistics, summaries, plots, and hopefully come to the same conclusions, which is really what we'd like to have from our analyses. So let me illustrate the importance of this concept of reproducibility using a couple of real examples of what happens when analyses are not done with this concept in mind. So the first example comes uh, from a scandal involving two scientists from Duke University and Neil Potty and Joseph Nevins. Uh, they claimed that they had identified gene signatures in cancer cell lines that predicted patient response to therapy and they published this finding in all the greatest journals that, that we have. And they sort of essentially had that holy grail of personalized medicine within their grasp. At least that, that was the claim. However, they had made several uh, sloppy errors in their Excel worksheets, which ultimately led to an attempted cover-up, all of which was unraveled in public by a couple of biostatisticians who were trying to reproduce their results. And the outcome was that cancer patients who had enrolled in a clinical trial based on these gene signatures almost received the wrong therapy. And many of these very high impact um, articles had to be retracted. Uh, but this is not just something that uh, impacts healthcare. It really is something that, that extends to all fields. This one coming from the field of economics. Uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff are two economists who uh, still work at Harvard. Um, they published a very controversial paper. The claim was they had identified a relationship between high national debt levels and reduced economic growth. And this was coming out during that Great Recession and was used as evidence by conservative policymakers really worldwide um, who believed that um, reducing government uh, spending would actually be beneficial in terms of getting, uh, getting their countries out of recession. Um, so that was their claim. Um, however, it turns out that uh, there was an error in their worksheet. It was uncovered by actually a grad student at University of Massachusetts. Um, and he only found it when he had insisted on getting the raw data from Reinhardt and Rogoff. And as it turns out, the uh, conclusion wasn't quite accurate. There um, is a negative relationship between national debt and um, economic growth, but was, it doesn't actually lead to contraction, as Reinhardt and Rogoff had claimed. And the outcome of this error really was that um, austerity, the policy known as austerity, was um, uh, used as a, as a kind of a tool to uh, drag these economies out of, uh, out of recession, perhaps unnecessarily. So, you know, these are sort of well-known publicized examples, but, you know, the question that I'd like to ask, somewhat controversially, is, are, you know, are we really immune from these kinds of, of issues? And I'd say that the answer is probably no. So who hasn't been in a position when they've been doing an analysis and they've asked themselves, well, where did I get these data from? How did I pull these data? If I wanted to get them again, would I be able to do it in the exact same way? How did I create this plot exactly? What were the steps that I took so that I came to this conclusion? How did I process the data, right? Data often needs to be kind of moved around a little bit before it's ready to be analyzed. And, you know, why did I decide to omit some of these outliers, right? What, what about them led to that? And am I doing it in a rigorous manner? Why does this happen? If you think of uh, this as being kind of a prototypical data analysis project, it's typically going to look like something like this. You're going to begin by defining your goals, um, the objectives of the project, and identify what data you're going to need to meet these goals. You're going to bring the data into your analytic software in some way, and you're going to tidy that data, by which I mean you're going to reshape it, you're going to clean it, get it into the right format so that you can do your data analysis. 
And at that point, you're ready to really begin to understand what's in the data. You're going to try to extract that information. And, and that usually goes through some kind of iterative cycle involving transforming the data, making plots, and modeling the data. And then the final piece is communicating your conclusions to, uh, to colleagues. So generally, this process occurs as a collaboration. Often there's an attending who's supervising a trainee. There might be a PI who's supervising a student. And the domain, domain expert, the supervisor, plays a dominant role in defining what the project is about, gathering the data set that needs to be analyzed, and then handing that off to the individuals who could be doing the analysis, the student or the trainee. So this might be a lab director, for instance, who's providing a list of patients, maybe who've had some kind of um, error, a transfusion reaction, and then that student's going to engage with the data with intermittent communication back with the, uh, with the supervisor. When Excel is used as the medium for this process, the workflow will involve points in which files need to be shared. What actually is going on within the context of um, the analysis kind of becomes a black box. So what we're essentially doing is we're effectively creating silos of data analysis. Mm -hmm. And what's going on on either end, on either side of that, of those walls, becomes a black box. And that's what we want to avoid. What um, we'd like to propose is adopting a new workflow in projects that involve data analysis. And this would be a more reproducible workflow, which will allow collaborators to analyze projects more effectively and more closely in a more transparent way by removing some of the barriers that are imposed by using Excel. And um, this workflow is really made possible by eliminating spreadsheets as much as possible and adopting a new tool known as computational documents, which Stefan is going to describe in more detail. So a key technology for reproducible um, data analysis or data science is called the computational document. And what's a computational document? A computational document is simply a document that has executable code inside of it. Um, so before I show you what a computational document, a document could look like, and how it fits into our reproducible workflow, let me introduce a few terms I'll be talking about. So the first is R. Oh, where's my pointer? Here. The first is R. R is a programming language for data analysis. And we use R for lots of reasons, including that it's free, it's great for wrangling data, and it creates great graphics. Also, you can use R to pull data from any of the databases that are being used at Pen and Chop, such as Epic, Cerner, and Soft. Uh, it's really just a matter of the permissions that need to be granted by the respective database administrators, and you can pull your data. Um, finally, and I'll be showing some data to support the statement, doing basic data analysis with R is actually not that difficult to learn, even if you're not a programmer. So then there is R Markdown. R Markdown is a computational document format that has executable code in it that is usually written in R. I say usually because it's actually possible to write code in Python, C++, and a bunch of other languages inside of an R Markdown document. But by default, we use R in R Markdown documents as the executable code. Finally, there is RStudio. RStudio is the name of a company and also a name of a piece of software that this company makes and makes available for free. You can think of RStudio as a fancy editor for writing R Markdown. And you can run RStudio on a Mac or on Windows, or if you're concerned about protecting patient data or intellectual property, it's fairly straightforward to lock down an RStudio server behind a hospital firewall. So I'm going to do a quick demo. Yes, OK. So this is the RStudio editor. And in our reproducible workflows, this is where we author our computational documents that are written in R Markdown. And you can write narrative to explain what you're doing. Uh, which is what I've done here. And you can also write some code. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So I'm going to wrote, write a line of code written in R to create a scatter plot of a sample data set. And I can actually run this code and see what the result is. So here I see the scatter plot of distance versus speed of some data set about cars. So let's say that you've been working on an analysis and are now ready to share the preliminary analysis and results uh, with a collaborator by email, or you just want to look at it together on a big screen like we're doing right now. So this is when you knit your R Markdown document. So I click on knit, knit to HTML. 
And what you get is this nicely formatted HTML document that you can view in, in any web browser. You can email to collaborators. This is really nice for prototyping analyses and, and looking at them together. You can also knit to PDF. So PDF, you might want to use uh, for a more polished look and for printing, for example, for a manuscript draft or an audit you want to present at a QI meeting. Well, you can knit to Word. So here I have a Word document that was just created from this document and it, it contains exactly the same information in it. So we use our markdown as the fundamental substrate of our reproducible data analysis workflow. You can imagine a PI and a grad student or a lab director and a technologist collaborating on this R Markdown document that contains all of the code to load the initial data, to make the data transformations necessary, uh, and to create summary tables and graphics. And as I've just shown, you can knit R Markdown documents into a bunch of different formats like HTML, PDF, and Word. You can also knit PowerPoint presentations and even interactive dashboards. And at CHOP, we've created a number of dashboards that are either written entirely in R Markdown or were at least prototyped in it. So here's a dashboard from uh, the Division of Genomic Diagnostics written by Madi Sarmadi's group. Um, this dashboard displays test volumes and turnaround times for the various molecular tests we do. And here's a dashboard that allows performing virtual cross matches for uh, solid organ transplant patients. And so I think it's worth pointing out that one area where our markdown power dashboards can really shine is when a lab information system provides 90% of the necessary functionality and you need to custom build the remaining 10%. And here knowing some basic R markdown can be really powerful for lab leaders because then they can take much more active ownership and be actively involved in the developing and iterating of these tools. So let's say that you're a busy clinician or researcher and you know your way, way around Excel. How can you get started with R Markdown? And this is something that I've been thinking about a lot for the past three years. And the outcome is the course I'll be talking about in the last few minutes of the talk. So the scope of this course is that we want participants to pick up the skills necessary for collaborating on a computational document written in R Markdown. So the goals of the course are to appreciate the meaning of reproducibility as it relates to data analysis, and to learn a practical way to analyze clinical data reproducibly. By the end of the course, participants will be able to define reproducibility, explain why it's important, and learn to use R in our studio to import, transform, and visualize data, and create a reproducible report, which is just another word for computational document in R Markdown. We streamlined the content so that the entire course fits into a one-day workshop that covers getting data into R, exploring that data graphically, and writing an R Markdown document. And we use active learning techniques such as concept mapping, think pair share, timed interactive exercises in which course participants practice coding in our markdown. And together, these in class activities get participants to a point where they can follow along the code of reproducible report that's written in our markdown. So we also invited our participants to complete an optional course project in the form of an R Markdown document that addresses some clinical or research question that they're personally or professionally interested in. And I want to highlight three here. So the first one is uh, from Lisa Zhang, a pathology resident who had no prior coding experience, who was able to construct a machine learning model to better triage peripheral blood flow cytometry specimens. And she presented her work at USCAP in a podium presentation, and her manuscript is in press at the American Journal of Clinical Pathology. Uh, David Dye is an MD-PhD student uh, who was able to put together a machine learning model uh, that uses features of primary Lewy body neuropathology to predict Alzheimer's disease. And Jess Lee, um, uh, another student, wrote an app in R Markdown for interactive exploration of RNA-seq data. So far, we've taught eight iterations of the course and three of them for the Penn Pathology Department. The Penn Pathology cohort consisted of 38 pathology residents, fellows, faculty, and a few others, including supervisors or analysts. And you can see that most of the participants were trainees, but we had a lot of participation from faculty as well, including some senior faculty members. Before the workshop, we surveyed participants about their confidence in their programming skills, and a lot of people indicated that they felt 
they didn't know enough about programming to really benefit from the course. So, so that's those, those folks over here. But when surveyed after the course, no one felt that the required knowledge about programming was too high for them to follow or benefit. And I think, and while I like to think that it's because of my superior teaching ability, it's more likely because this material just isn't really that difficult to learn or understand when presented in the correct format. Uh, overall, participants felt that the course achieved its stated objectives. People felt more confident in their ability to load data sets in R, to uh, transform data, and to create graphic plots. And on a scale where zero is unsatisfying and 10 is outstanding, the workshop received an average rating of 9.6. To sum up, the Excel poses significant risks to data quality, which can damage reputation and harm patients. A reproducible data analysis workflow can improve the data quality and accelerate development of data products. Computational documents are a key technology for reproducible data analysis, and we've developed a curriculum to teach reproducible data analysis to pathology trainees, faculty, and staff. Uh, so we've also taught this material at last year's Pathology Informatics Summit, and we've been invited to do it again in Pittsburgh next year. We're also developing an extended version of this course as a part of a new rigor and reproducibility module for the Penn MD PhD students. And so you can see that the overarching goal here is to create a community of researchers and clinicians who are conversant in reproducible data analysis, not only inside the pathology department, but throughout the medical school and the hospitals.